Hello, hello. This is your host, Traz Ahmed, ready to kick off another bite-sized episode of the Crypto Valley Association podcast. A special thank you goes out to Script for supporting us. Now let's discover together the growing trends of this fast-moving space and try to shed some light on the mysteries it contains. Today, we are joined by Makoto Takimiya, CEO of Soramitsu, a global technology company delivering blockchain-based solutions for enterprises, universities, and governments. So let's dive straight into the hidden world of technology development. Makoto, great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, uh, let's dive uh, straight in then, uh, shall we? Maybe you can share with us your first blockchain-related experience. Oh, that was quite a while ago. So <laughs> I first got into blockchain in 2013. In January, it is on Mount Gox in, uh, when I lived in Japan and uh, did some trading. I even wrote a bot uh, that traded Bitcoin, but it actually wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very <laughs> successful and I lost um, a lot of money. And then, of course, Gox kind of got <laughs> into trouble too. <laughs> It was a, a weird experience, but but it it taught me taught me a lot uh, mm -hmm. about you know self custody of assets of you know your own personal custody and, and being able to take responsibility and not relying on uh, intermediaries and sometimes it hurts uh, but it it you know that's how you learn and improve. So from that experience, uh, I worked on other blockchain systems. Uh, I contributed to some open source project projects, and uh, then in 2016, I was able to create my company Soramitsu. So uh, that was, we wanted to focus on using blockchain for enterprise solutions. So actually being able to build, you know, different platforms and apps that uh, enterprises can use that would increase efficiency because, yeah, there's a lot of inefficiency in, in payments and identity management and tracking mm -hmm. different things. And we really wanted to make all this uh, simple and, and kind of unified uh, together. Part of it's because I also, in 2000. In the early 2000s, when I lived in the U.S., I worked uh, in a company building logistics software um, mm -hmm. using AI. And yeah, it was really interesting how just a small, like 1% or 2% increase can actually save quite a lot of uh, money mm -hmm. and reduce things like fuel usage and things like that. So that kind of optimization uh, just uh, got really, it was really interesting to me. So optimizing things like payments and digital asset management and uh, you know, access to capital. These are some of my uh, personal passions. Awesome. Well, yeah, success is in the, the small details, right? So uh, it's great to, great to hear. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, Soramitsu and, and, and how things have been going on that front. So Soramitsu, uh, is a, I like to describe it as a boutique uh, blockchain fintech company. And uh, so we're, we're still pretty small. We're still under 100 people, but we're getting mm -hmm. Closer um, to that, we're international group now, based in Switzerland. So that's uh, that's why we're talking today. But we originally were founded in in Japan, as, as I'm also a Japanese national. And yeah, we I, we tried to build the full stack of applications. So what I mean is, we built uh, the core blockchain platform that we use, and then we also built uh, apps on top of it. So we. We're a contributor to Hyperledger project of a blockchain platform called Hyperledger Iroha, which is open source platform. And we still contribute very heavily to it. And we use uh, Iroha in, in many of our apps, not, you know, in all the apps, we, we use the right tool for the right job. But for many things that we do, like, uh, like uh, digital payment systems, we use Hyperledger Iroha for this. And um, it allows us to really fine tune the user experience and uh, be able to to build in safeguards. So for example, if somebody loses uh, their device, you know, they don't lose all their digital assets, mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that. So I'm kind of like a control, I'm very controlling, I think, in, mm -hmm. in that I try to have full control over the full stack rather than having to rely on other people's um, design decisions, which maybe is a, a bit unusual for some of the companies in this space, but I think mm -hmm. it does uh, some advantage. Yeah, I, I understand needing to be careful after going through the, the Mt. Gox uh, hack. But uh, may, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit more about why you decided to move from Japan to Switzerland. What what attracted you towards Switzerland? Well, Switzerland does have a good startup environment, especially regulatory environment for digital assets. And that was the main consideration over Japan, though Japan, of course, is a uh, you know, very nice place. Um, I, <laughs> I I like it as well. And we still have a company there in our group. But uh, yeah, the headquarters is now in Zug. And Zug is nice because there's a lot of 
people that understand blockchain there in the in the local government, and that makes it kind of easier to talk to people and um, and uh, you know do new try new things. Uh, so uh, when we wanted to issue a, a digital token, we decided to go to Switzerland uh, for that. Okay, great to hear. I'm guessing it wasn't uh, for the better sushi they have in uh, Tsugi that you moved there. <laughs> <laughs> Sora sushi um, in Zurich. But... <laughs> <laughs> great to great to hear and and so more about sir me here and so how how is it to work with both the private and the public sector on various uh, blockchain projects as they operate in such different ways how how do you how do you manage those operations so sir me i think is yeah very unique in this space in that we uh, we do work with government agencies so we work with the central bank of cambodia and we built actually the world's first retail like blockchain based payment system uh, that exists in the world today wow. project bakong and that uh, you know that launched with real money in 2019 uh, so mm-hmm. it's quite quite early and then officially launched uh, this year uh, from the rollout uh, to the whole country so that that's been a big project that we've done and maybe i can talk more about it later but we've also done quite a lot of other projects we did a lot of uh, consulting and, and prototypes which i think a lot of blockchain companies do but we've also uh, you know worked in the cryptocurrency space as well so we work with the web3 foundation which is also based in switzerland and um, we built a c++ uh, version of polkadot Okay. And we've also worked with uh, protocol labs and building a C++ version of Filecoin and, you know, things like a C++ uh, libp2p library. And uh, now we're working on the Sora. Uh, well, Sora is our kind of a crypto anarchic <laughs> uh, project that we contribute to. And that's a kind of like a decentralized central bank. And I'm happy to, okay. to talk about that more. But on top of the Sora network, we're building a, a DEX for, uh, we got a grant to build a DEX for uh Polkadot ecosystem wow. called PokerSwap. And, uh, and then we've also been building uh, a, a digital currency wallet called a Fearless Wallet for the um, Kusama and Polkadot ecosystems. So we've done wow. quite a lot of you know, kind of eclectic uh, things, but uh, they do share some common threads. We've done a lot of work uh, with payment systems and with as part of the payment systems for uh, corporations and for uh, governments, we we do manage uh, digital identities as well. Um, one one project I forgot to mention that's also kind of interesting is we in Japan uh, we worked on building a digital payment system for University of Aizu, which is in mm-hmm. Fukushima Prefecture. It's called Byako, and uh, that's a it's it's kind of a replacement for just uh, prepaid cards that mm-hmm. students used at the cafeteria and uh, campus store, but we just made a nice digital app that uses it and uh, to make it really easy to to use uh, like a payments system uh, just on the university campus. And so this mm-hmm. is kind of like a fun uh, project that we've done. But yeah, working with governments and large, you know, banks and, and institutions is uh, is quite, you know, challenging thing and uh, it takes a lot of uh, work and effort. But uh, I would say that's also equally challenging to work with, you know, public uh, cryptocurrencies, but the challenges are in different ways. Um, but mm-hmm. Both are kind of, in many ways, safety critical domains, because if you lose, you know, if there's some kind of a flaw in the software, people can lose money and that's not, you know, it's, it's a pretty serious thing. And uh, I would say in, in, in many ways, the open blockchain space is even stricter because, uh, you know, if a, if a central bank system, if anything happened, you know, uh, in theory, there's ways that you can uh, solve that. But in a public blockchain space, uh, if there's some kind of bug in the software, that's really you know, unsolvable mm-hmm. <laughs> without like a hard fork, <laughs> like a <laughs> dream uh, once upon a time. But yes. yeah, so it's it's really, yeah, the, the dichotomy between the two worlds is very interesting. And I think mm-hmm. it gives us a very unique perspective as well. Um, it's kind of like learning a, a different language. So people yeah. who learn multiple languages have, a, mm-hmm. I think, more of a deeper perspective on, on life uh, than if you yes. learn just a single language, because mm-hmm. uh, you you have to, Kind of see the world in a different way and be able to comprehend it and, and it gives you a greater uh, sense of empathy i think uh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's been a very interesting experience i can imagine it sounds like a lot of building and a lot of very interesting projects maybe one that you mentioned right at the beginning with the national bank of cambodia i mean does that mean that the acceptance toward this new technology is growing yeah, well, in some ways, right? So Cambodia is very strict about things like digital, like cryptocurrencies. Like they don't mm-hmm. allow cryptocurrencies in, in the country currently in the current regulatory regime, which is one of the strictest in, in the world. But on the other hand, uh, the central bank is using blockchain in their uh, payment system, which is quite quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. dichotomy. 
I think it shows a greater acceptance over embracing technology that is um, more robust and unstoppable. And I think that's a very good trend uh, to have. I think this is just one of many steps that will be taken in the future. So it's it's not you know in its complete form yet. But in the future, I think having a more open and decentralized uh, financial system and financial markets infrastructure will uh, make everything much more transparent and, and resilient as well. So instead of like regulators getting reports and finding problems after the fact, uh, you know, rules can be programmed uh, to prevent uh, problems from happening in the first place. And I think that's that, that's a trend that we're going to see uh, really play out a lot over the next ten years. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So. Uh, following on that wave of thought there, what, what are your thoughts about CBDCs then? I mean, last season, we had an interesting discussion uh, with an economist discussing their growth in Europe. Uh, what's your perspective with regards to CBDCs in, in Asia? Well, yeah, it's quite a, a deep topic, I think. So the, the system we built in Cambodia actually can be thought of as a CBDC system because according to the IMF's definition, it, it matches the definition that it's a digital digitized liability of the central bank that retail c- consumers can use for payments. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it, it's not really you know, a magical thing. So depending on the design decisions that are made, you can create a CBDC that either competes with commercial banks or that helps commercial banks. And I think in Cambodia, a lot of emphasis was put on designing the parameters so that commercial banks were not disintermediated, but rather um, they have new new tools in which to serve uh, their customers. But yeah, in Europe, there's quite a lot of uh, debate as to, you know, should the central bank, should someone like the ECB open up their balance sheet directly to retail customers, uh, which I, I don't think will, will happen, but at least not for regular Retail, maybe in the wholesale space, we'll see more and more of this. Um, but uh, like the Bank of England, for instance, uh, they open up uh, their balance sheet to, to large non-bank institutions, um, not only banks. <clears throat> so in, in the same sense, I think CBDC is really going to be a continuation of uh, current trends rather than anything really um, revolutionary. I do think mm-hmm. that central banks offering digital currency APIs and, and open banking systems will mm-hmm. allow allow their fiat currencies to be used in a more convenient way, which will be, um, I think, very important to stopping, uh, you know, trends such as uh, dollarization or, or, you know, proliferation of other uh, fiat currencies from other countries, or even supranational di- digital currencies, such as, uh, you know, what DM is working on. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we'll see. It's it's very fast moving space. There's a lot of uncertainties, even in the world economy right now. So, you know, all bits of are course. off. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary place. And I guess that's why you released the, the, the fearless wallet, uh, <laughs> to be uh, fearless <laughs> in, in, in the face of this. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that project and, and what makes it uh, so special. So Fearless is a, uh, yeah, so it, it's it's a wallet that originally came about because of people in the Kusama ecosystem. So Kusama is like one of the networks in like the Polkadot ecosystem. You've got Polkadot and you've got Kusama. They're separate networks and Kusama is kind of like geared towards faster evolution and trying new things and experimenting. And, and that's really why we uh, went with the name Fearless. There's also some in, inside jokes for those who were in uh, the, the Polkadot event in Berlin in 2019. <laughs> we we had a we made uh, pink T-shirts with Gavin's uh, face on it and uh, <laughs> said like fearless, fearless uh, libertarian leader. So that was um, <laughs> that was just a fun thing that we we had. So it's kind of like a play on that, but also a play on you know the fact that Kusama is meant to be. Like a bold and brave uh, new, you know, network that you can try new things. You don't have to be afraid of uh, breaking things and failing. Also, it, uh, in the general sense, the, the cryptocurrency space and self-custodial space in, in general, I think it's really, you know, it's it's all about being fearless and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, being bold and taking uh, responsibility over your own uh, digital assets and uh, and and you know that that can actually make the world a better place because uh, it decentralizes uh, a lot of the control and it, it can lead to better more socially acceptable outcomes i think in the long run mm-hmm. yes no definitely and um, you've also developed a groundbreaking decentralized um economic system called uh sora i mean it's, it's aimed at 
changing the way goods and services are bought, are brought to market. Uh, sorry, I mean, can you tell us more uh, about this? So Sora is kind of like a, a decentralized central bank. <laughs> so hmm. that sounds kind of, you know, like an ox oxymoron, but uh, it, it kind of makes sense. So it, intuitively, like central bank is like, you know, most people think of it as like the issuer of money. It's it's really not the, the sole issuer of, of most of the money in the economy. But the common viewpoint is that central banks, you know, issue money and then like this money gets distributed. And uh, in, in Sora, what we have is we have a decentralized way to decide the uh, the creation distribution of, um, of new tokens. So if you study, you know, different macroeconomic theories, especially things like the disaggregated uh, quantity theory of credit, you can find that it's really the expansion and pur purchasing power uh, that's used for production, for productive activity to create uh, new goods and services. It's this expansion and purchasing power that drives economic growth. And it's you know, it's been shown by the work of uh, Professor Richard Werner that uh, it's it's both necessary and sufficient to have uh, credit creation for production uh, in order to have economic growth. So you don't you don't have to play with things like interest rates or anything like that. So in the cryptocurrency space, you have Bitcoin, and Bitcoin uh, currently is inflationary. It won't always be, but uh, every new block, you know, some new Bitcoins are minted, and these are given to to miners. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not creating new purchasing power for production, rather it's creating it for consumption. And Bitcoin, you know, goes up in value just because, because more people are, are coming into the ecosystem. It's not because there's no, there's no productive output, right? There's no new goods and services being created, you know, with these newly minted Bitcoins. And uh, so what we want to do in Sora is to really like create a way that new capital can be uh, created and allocated for production. So things like you know, if you wanted to create, uh, so you're in Switzerland. So if you wanted, especially the French part, if you wanted to create like a new wine company and uh, a vineyard, buy some land, you know, uh, plant some grapes, wait a few years, <laughs> make some wine, wait a few years, you can have uh, some new product. So you have new new outputs, you have new outputs. And if you, if you mint new money to create this new output and the two, you know, more or less balanced, then you don't have, you know, reduction in purchasing power. Obviously, in the wine example, there's a large temporal lag. But if you have, uh, you know, a very large economy, a lot of these lags will average out. So in in Sora, we want to make it so that so we we tried a, a couple of iterations of the project. So we want to originally we just had unbounded ability to create tokens, but this was kind of it, it's kind of hard to to rationalize that. You know, the amount of token creation is kind of hard to um, analytically. Uh, come to. Mm -hmm. So instead, we are using a token bonding curve where it's a market driven activity. So if people, if there's high demand for the token, more tokens get minted. And if there's low demand, then then actually tokens get taken out of circulation or deminted. And then a portion of the minted amount goes to into like, basically a fund, and then this fund can give capital to producers, then the producers should sell their goods and services in exchange for the, the currency XR. Uh, in order to balance out the the creation of the new the newly created goods, right? So mm -hmm. or the newly created money. So the goods and the money should should balance out over time. Okay, understood. Yeah. And and uh, so that's so generally, if if producers are efficient, you know, they can actually produce way more output than the input uh, as okay. far as you know, monetary base uh, is concerned. So that's kind of what we're doing. We are working on the token bonding curve implementation now. That's going to be the Sora V2 network. And mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be using a parity substrate blockchain uh, mm -hmm. tech. And that'll be, we want to get a pair chain for Kusama and Polkadot. So that'll be in the Polkadot okay. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at launching this in Q1 next year. So okay. it's getting pretty close. We've been working on this uh, for quite a while <laughs> since uh -huh. uh, March. So it's been, it takes a long time to build high quality software, actually, especially in the, uh, in this kind of safety critical, um, you know, financial space. Yeah. You said, well, make sure for the audience to keep their uh, eyes out for that. And uh, yeah, I mean. I love how we used the example of the of a vineyard uh, for wine for the Swiss French. Um, <laughs> they can depict us uh, quite uh, quite well. And so we, we spoke about many uh, many different projects that you're working with, helping develop and build. What's your what's your your vision for the future of this whole industry? Uh, it's a good question. So my uh, you know there's many paths, there's many risks, but my I wouldn't say my vision, but my hope is that uh, this technology can be used to really empower mankind. And uh, you know, give give producers who need capital the capital that they need to go and create new things because this is uh, what pushes humanity forward. And I think that you know, it's a big universe, uh, and I think we need to expand more into it. 
you know, beyond this, mm-hmm. this tiny ball, though it's a very nice place. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that it's, it's really important to, um, you know, to really push things forward as, as fast as they can go because, uh, you know, there are lots of risks and uh, a lot of people, especially as we saw this year, a lot, a lot of people are still, I think, overly enslaved uh, by, by, you know, mm-hmm. whatever political system that they're in. In Japan, you know, we're really lucky that the government's not really overbearing and people don't push, uh, you know, they don't uh, force people to do weird things without any, <laughs> any science uh, behind it. So, but in, in Europe, the trends are a bit uh, concerning, I would say. Very interesting. Well, yeah, definitely. If we can reach out and get past uh, our stratosphere, land on the moon, it'd be uh, great, uh, I think, for, 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 for many. Uh, within the community. So thank you so much for that uh, insightful, futuristic uh, vision speech there. Maybe before we close up uh, today, do you have any final words you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, so like everything we do is really open source, like all the the key products and and, uh, technologies. So people who are, you know, good at programming, we we really encourage people to come and, you know, build on what we're doing. Soar Network, is going to you know allow people to write smart contracts and create their own apps on top of it. So if you're interested in the Sora ecosystem, you know you can come and build your own like decentralized apps or any any kind of app. Like there's there's lots of potential there. Um, like basically everything still has to be built, right? <laughs> though, we, though we are building a, a dex called a PokeSwap with uh, we got a Web3 grant for that. So yeah, people who are you know interested, you know can check out ex- check out our website soramitsu.co.jp or sora.org, which is our the website for the open source uh, Sora project. So yeah, please contribute. You know, let's create a better world together. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Still lots to build, but uh, very hopeful yeah, that it will be done. So if you enjoyed uh, this conversation, feel free to check out more on our website, cryptovalley.swiss, where we host plenty of events, educational content, and even provide information on how you can join our growing community. So thanks again, uh, Makoto, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So stay tuned, stay safe. And until next time from the Crypto Valley in Switzerland. Bye-bye.